Hey guys, I'm Caesar, and this week on Food is Good, we're gonna be making a traditional Southern comfort dish, like a warm hug from grandma. We're gonna be making fried chicken, collard greens, pinto beans, and coleslaw. I promise you, you're gonna enjoy it. We'll be right back. So guys, like I said, we're gonna be knocking out fried chicken, pinto beans, greens, and slaw. First thing we're gonna do is pinto beans. Now growing up down south in Alabama, we didn't do a whole lot of pinto beans. Uh, we did more red beans and rice, or red beans. We did more llama beans, navy beans, but not just pinto beans. And something I realized is that depending on the area you're in, that area has a preference to the bean of choice. In Tennessee, we do a lot of pinto beans and northern beans. And like I said, down in Alabama, we did a lot of llama beans, um, uh, uh, red beans down there. So that was kind of king down there. But anyway, <laughs> I move on. So back to the store. We're going to go ahead and take our pinto beans that I've already taken them and soaked them overnight. So I'm going to grab these out right here. And there's two different processes. You can soak them overnight, which is going to cut down on your cook time, or you can take them from the store, rinse them, and then cook them. You're gonna almost guarantee to double your cook time. And there's some pros and cons of doing an eat bar both ways. I like soaking the beans overnight just because it's gonna buy me some more time. It's gonna be a shorter uh, process. They're not gonna be as dark. So if you want a darker look on your beans or a darker, darker color on your beans, go ahead and cook them right then, but just know it's gonna take time. We're gonna go ahead and take these beans right here that we've soaked overnight. This is about two pounds. This is two pounds of beans right here. I'm gonna drain the water off of it. Whenever I'm cooking my pinto beans, I always start off with cold water just because I want them to cook from the inside out. So that's very important when you're cooking your beans. So like I said, I'm gonna take them, drain them, add them to my water I already have over there, but I'll show you what I'm gonna do next. So let's do that and then I'll season it. So I'm gonna drain this water off of them. Drain the water off of them. You may lose a few beans in the process, but it's okay. So we're gonna take this. We've already rinsed the beans also before we soaked them overnight. So I'm gonna pour them right here. Now in my water I have over here, I'm gonna go ahead and season it up. And I'm gonna start off with some bay leaves, a little salt, a pinch of sugar, and that can be very controversial down south because we like to put, they put sugar in everything, I guess up north, down south we don't put sugar in our cornbread, our pinto beans, or our collard greens, but I put sugar in all three of them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little salt in it. Salt's very important. A little salt, that was three tablespoons of salt, two pounds of beans, actually that was one pound of bean over there. Pinch of sugar just a pinch of sugar, a bay leaf, two bay leaves actually, we're gonna add that to it, and then onion. You gotta put onions in your beans. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these onions ready right here. And I'm, this is a pretty big size onion right here. And for the amount of beans that I'm using, I'm only gonna use half an onion in it. Uh, size does matter when you're chopping down this onion right here simply because if you use a big onion chop, a big piece of onion in there, it's not gonna cook as much, it's not gonna cook as quick as you want it to cook. And um, the beans are already soaked. So you're looking at about 30 minutes, 40, 30 to 45 minutes on those beans right there. Just depends on what kind of stove you're using and all that good stuff. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna make smaller pieces of onions here just so we can put them in there and they cook. So we're gonna go ahead and break this down Definitely want onions in your beans. That's flavoring right there. Not even quite a whole onion, because that was a pretty big onion. Not quite a half onion, because that was a pretty big onion. So I'm gonna put that in there. There is a secret that I am gonna do. Since these beans are cooking, and I have them, I like to cook everything on high. 
And unless you can stay there and watch it, I wouldn't recommend it. So I'm gonna cut it down just a little. But you want those beans to come to a rolling boil. And while they're coming to a rolling boil, not at this point right here, but a little bit more in the process, you're gonna wanna add a little canola oil to it. And that's gonna emulsify your liquids and give you that thickness that you're gonna get from it when you're cooking your beans slow like that. And that's the part I really like because it goes really good with cornbread. So guys, we're just gonna let it do its thing over there. I'm gonna go ahead and cover it up right here and let us do its thing. You're looking at, you're really looking at, like I said, 30 to 45 minutes. We're close to the 45 minutes mark on those beans right there. So like I said, we're gonna be making greens, but let me make one clarification about your pinto beans. It depends on what type of stove you're cooking on, and it depends on where you have that temperature on your stove at. I like to cook mine on medium to high because I'm in the kitchen, I'm gonna watch them that entire time. I'm normally doing something else. If you're gonna do that, you can do it in about 45 minutes, but if you wanna turn those things down to a slow simmer, just know it's gonna take right around two hours on those green, on those, uh, on those beans. So just know that, that's kind of like a small footnote. So the next thing we're gonna be working on is collard greens. I'm a big fan of turnip greens. However, my wife loves collard greens. So we do a lot of collard greens. And a lot of people down south like collard greens. So with those collard greens, one thing I will say, you definitely have to wash those collard greens. And there's a lot of different ways you can wash them. In the restaurant, we would wash them three different times, making sure we got everything off those collard greens. I mean, they're grown in the ground, right? So wanna make sure you got them really good and clean. So we're gonna wash these greens, making sure that I'm looking at all the leaves, making sure there's no dirt or any of that or grit on those leaves. I'm gonna do this here. So as I'm washing them, I'll just sit them over here. Very important. And like I said, we used to wash them three times, but this is right around a pound and a half of greens. In the restaurant, we would wash 30 pounds of greens dry my hands off. Then we're gonna bring the greens back over here. And what we're gonna do next is very important with these greens. So while my greens are here, what I'm gonna do, because I like, unlike pinto beans, I like to put the greens in the water that's already been seasoned. So in that, same thing with pinto beans, the, the cooking is so similar. Uh, and probably in a lot of the southern dishes, especially when you're doing vegetables, there's a lot of similarities. The seasoning is what's gonna make it different. And my collard greens, I'm gonna start off and put a little butter in my collard greens. The water's already come to a boil over here, and you want that when you put those greens in there. I'm gonna put a little red pepper flakes in there, a little salt in there, a pinch, there you go, a pinch of sugar, in there, just a pinch, not too much. And then an onion. Now I'm gonna cut my onion a little different than I did when I, uh, when I did my pinto beans. Whenever I'm cutting vegetables, I like the vegetables to kind of mirror what kind of, uh, whenever I'm cutting my onions, I'm sorry, whenever I'm cutting my onions, I want it to kind of mirror whatever kind of vegetables I'm doing. So like if I'm doing pinto beans, I'm gonna make the onion cut a little smaller. If I'm doing green beans, I'm gonna make them a little larger, kind of so they mirror the greens, the, uh, the item that I'm cooking. With the greens here, I'm just gonna julienne these greens and put them in, julienne these onions, I'm sorry, and put them in there. So what I'm gonna do is just julienne small, thin slices is all that means. Right here, take that. And I'm just gonna add this onion to my greens. Oh, that's to the, to the broth of it, the water of it. I'm gonna add that in there. I can smell those pinto beans cooking. Definitely want to stir those up though. So I'm going to stir these pinto beans up just a little. See that? So now back to the greens. I'm going to take my leaves and I'm going to lay them flat. And then I'm going to roll them together. Some people use the stem or cut this, uh, use the stalk or the stem of it. I particularly like to cut them out just because they can be a little bit more tough. And I want my greens to get done around the same time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take this right here and I'm just gonna cut it out. Do you have to? You don't have to. I do though. I'm just gonna cut this out. 
and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll these greens. So I'm going to roll these greens instead of rolling them this way, and I don't really guess it matters a whole lot. The idea is just to roll your greens to get them uniform and to chop them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll them like this right here. And then I'm just going to chop them thin. Think about collard greens. You want to chop them thin because you don't want thick leaves because it's already a tough leaf. So you don't want them real thick. It's just going to make your cooking time longer. And now that I've sliced them this way, I'm going to come right down the middle and do a little chop down the middle so they'll be smaller. So I'm going to take these greens right here, add them to my liquid that I've already seasoned. And just put the lid on them. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to add a little oil in those beans just to emulsify them. That's the secret right there because I want those beans to thicken up. So while my beans and greens is doing fine over there, we're going to start on the next thing, which is the coleslaw. And guys, coleslaw, traditional cabbage. That's it. Don't get fancy. You don't need the bok choy. You don't need the savoy. You just want the green head of cabbage. So I'm going to pull it out. So. Head of cabbage right here. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna cut the end of it off, throw it over here in my waste bowl. And I'm gonna peel some of the leaves back. I like peeling the leaves back because any of your dirt and all of that where people have been touching it at, it's gonna be on the outside that people that they touch, obviously. So what I'm gonna do is that now that I've done this right here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this up. So I'm gonna cut my cabbage in half. Coleslaw, really simple. Very few ingredients. You have the cabbage, you have the carrots, you have mayo, sugar, vinegar, and a pinch of salt. So cut this cabbage in half right here, and I'm gonna go ahead and shred it up on my shredder. So right here. So I'm gonna grab my shredder and I'm gonna, I leave the core in it because when I go to shred it up, it won't fall apart too early. So we're just gonna shred this up. Whenever you're using a shredder or a grater, definitely keep those fingers back. We're gonna shred this up right here. We're shredding it up right here. Working now. This is my workout for the day. Shredding these up right here. A little bit more. Really easy to make. One of the first things I think I learned how to make when I started cooking uh, in restaurants was coleslaw. And there's a lot of different variations of it. You can add a little celery seed to it. Actually in Tennessee, and not Tennessee, but in Cleveland, Tennessee, where I'm at, I've been here for 30 years. Beautiful place. Um, home of Lee University. Hot slaw is another very popular item here. Uh, actually, we just had the hot slaw festival just yesterday. Uh, and that's a whole nother episode, whole other ingredient. But look it up sometime. It's really good though. So we're gonna take a carrot, and I've have a couple of carrots over here that I've already washed and peeled. I'm gonna shred this carrot up also in my coleslaw or in my cabbage as of right now. It'll be coleslaw in a second. I'm going to shred this up. Some coleslaws are vinegar based. This right here is not going to be vinegar based. It's going to be more mayo based. Okay. I think that's good. I'm going to put this over uh, back over here. So now we have our carrots, our coleslaw, our carrots and our cabbage. Next thing we're gonna do, and it's very important, we keep this dry, we're gonna start on our wet. And our wet is gonna consist of mayo, vinegar, sugar, and a little salt. And then we're gonna incorporate the two. And I'll tell you why I do that in a, in a quick second. The re well, I guess I'll tell you now. The reason is, if you make, if you add your liquid, straight to your cabbage and, and uh, carrot, and you add too much, 
you, you've pretty much ruined the dish. So what I've learned over the years is if I keep them separately and then incorporate the amount that I want, I think it comes out perfect or I know it comes out perfect every time. But also know once you add that vinegar to your cabbage and your carrots here, that vinegar is gonna start breaking it down. So the way it looks now is not how it's gonna look in the next few hours. So when you eat it is important, but know that so you may not wanna add as much liquid to it or you may have a runny product. And we've had that, I'm actually speaking from experience. So I'm gonna add in a half a cup of mayo. And to that half a cup of mayo, I'm gonna add some vinegar. Add some vinegar to it. Add some sugar. I've only made this item, I don't know, at least 300 million times. <laughs> so, I'm gonna go ahead and stir this up. I'm gonna add the, the salt at the end. I'm gonna add a pinch of salt, just a pinch. The salt actually enhances the sweetness of it. So now we got that. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it here and I'm gonna incorporate this in it. I didn't put it all in there. I'm gonna stir this up. It looks good. Still has some good texture to it, good body to it. Stir this up right here. It actually looks really good, to be honest with you. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add it to my bowl, and I'm gonna put this in a cooler to let it chill. Mm -hmm. Refrigerator. So, that's in the cooler. Chilling, nothing like cold coleslaw. Hmm. Pinto beans is doing this thing over there. I'm gonna take another quick peek. They're definitely thickening up. Definitely. Do this right here. Greens is looking good. Guys, when we come back, I'm gonna go ahead and start on our fried chicken. Our cast iron, I didn't tell you that at the beginning, but we're gonna start on our cast iron fried chicken. Guys, you're gonna love it. So guys, the next thing we're gonna be tackling is we're gonna be doing fried chicken. And best way, I, what I like about doing fried chicken is, and there's a couple of different ways you can do it, but I think one of the best ways, I like to just take a boneless, skinless breast, and then I'm gonna butterfly that breast. I'll show you that in a quick second. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and put my oil, and I fry whenever I'm frying, I use canola oil to fry. There's some people who have peanut allergies. Obviously, if you want a hot mess, you can do some olive oil, which is a hot mess. I've never, I would not recommend that at all. You always wanna use a canola oil, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put canola oil. Actually, I have some that up here. Canola oil in my cast iron skillet that I'm gonna get hot, but before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead, my beans, they're looking good. Greens, definitely looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and move my beans from here over to here, cut this on. I'm gonna cut it down just a little, because like I said, if you wanna do them on a simmer, it's gonna take you about two hours, but we wanted to get these done in a whole lot less time, so they're up high. But I'm gonna go ahead and crank that heat down just a little, because I don't, like I said, I don't want them bubbling over or steaming over into my hot oil. That's a hot mess on a whole nother day, on a whole nother station. You don't want those two to mix. Oil and water don't mix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and cut this on. Not on high though. And I actually, what I have is, I actually have a thermometer. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put my oil in my cast iron skillet. I want this oil 350. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour it in there. Cut my oil on, and I have a thermometer right here. It's a candy thermometer, an oil thermometer, and it's gonna let me know when this is at 350. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it right here, but you wanna have one of those, and that's the thing about whenever you're cooking with a cast iron, the cast iron's good by holding, 
good for holding that heat in. If you have that oil up too high, you're gonna burn your chicken or burn whatever you're cooking every single time. So I recommend if you're gonna use a cast iron skillet, always use a thermometer so you can see what temperature that oil is. So like I said, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and start putting my mixture together for my fried chicken. And it always starts with a buttermilk wash. So I'm gonna put a little buttermilk right here. Buttermilk here. I'm also going to crack one egg in this wash right here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my eggs out. I'm going to crack one egg in here. I'm going to beat this up right here really good. Get it mixed in there really good. Because I use a lot of spoons here. Whenever I'm using any kind of, I'm working with any of my pans, I like to use a wooden spoon just because I don't want the metal on the metal. So I'll use wood here. So I have a lot of little spoons. It's one of my things I like a lot. So we got this right here. So now we have the egg wash right here. I'm gonna take some flour. I'm gonna take my flour. And I'm gonna add in roughly three cups of flour, AP flour. Right here. There's no exact measurement there because you're just using this as a, as a wash and then you're gonna dredge it over here. I'm gonna add in some garlic. Add some garlic here. Add some salt, garlic, salt, cracked black pepper. Now this is gonna be my dredge here. I'm also gonna add a little parsley to it, just cause I want that prettiness. Cause people eat with their eyes, right? So we got that mixed in. I'm gonna go ahead and take my chicken right here. Set this here. Nice, good looking piece of boneless, skinless chicken breast. And what I'm gonna do is, and I'll tell you something, I'm gonna go ahead and take this chicken and I'm gonna butterfly this chicken just so it gets a nice even cook because you can see it's thinner here and fatter here. And I want that chicken to cook about the same time, not about the same time, but I want that chicken to cook the same times. I can't tell you how many times I have butterflied chicken. It's not that hard if you take your time and you feel the blade of the knife going under your fingers. Perfect. Right here, what it looks like. I'm gonna do another one because we're gonna do two of them. Some big chicken breasts here, big, nice looking chicken breasts, actually. You know, sometimes you can get smaller ones. I like these right here. I'm just gonna butterfly this open. There again, I'm feeling the knife up under my fingers. Right here, okay? Right here. And what I'm gonna do, these things are so big, I'm gonna go ahead and cut these in half. Right here. Right here. And now I'm gonna take them, and whenever I'm dredging my chicken, I'm gonna start off with a dry, right here. You can use tongs if you really don't wanna put your hands on the chicken like that, it works. Drip it a little. I'm gonna put it back in my dry, so dry, wet, dry. and I'm gonna sit it right to the side over here. And by letting it sit over here also, I didn't say this, but by letting it sit over here, that breader kind of sticks to that chicken and it, when you're frying it up, it doesn't curl. So I'm gonna do the last one. The last one here. 
And I normally I will wash my hands right after I finish doing chicken, but I'm literally about to take this chicken over here and put it in my hot grease once I check it to see if it's at the right temperature. This definitely works right here, and it says that the grease is ready. If you don't have a candy thermometer or a oil thermometer, you can always use an instant read thermometer. Like I'm temping it right now, and it's telling me that it's still, it, it's, it's there. It's hitting right at 360, which once I put that cold chicken in there, it's gonna drop in temperature. So then you just become the, it's the game of trying to get it to maintain that. We're gonna put this in there. And that's exactly what you're looking for. You want to do just like that. You don't wanna crowd it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put one more, put one more in here, some big chicken. Yeah, so right here. So I'm going to chicken cook about three minutes and then I'm going to flip it and cook it three more minutes and then I'm going to temp it because I want it to hit 165 to make sure it's done. Okay. Okay, so the chicken is definitely brown in here. We're going to go ahead and flip it over. Oh, it looks good. It smells good too. I'm going to turn my oil down just a little. Just a little. So this is almost done. Guys, it's looking good. It's smelling good. Chicken has really good color on it. It looks amazing. What I'm gonna do, I have a napkin down just to absorb the extra oil that's coming off of it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tempt it. It should hit 165. And I'm gonna say it's done, 165. Right here, you always wanna have an instant read thermometer. I'm gonna take this right here. And like I said, this napkin absorbs the, absorbs the oil. So we have that there. I'm going to cut my oil off right here. Chicken looks amazing. So I'm gonna take the chicken and I'm gonna put it right here. I'm gonna go ahead and pull off my greens and my pinto beans. So I'm gonna put my pinto beans right here and my, my greens right here. Take those lids off right here. And now what I'm going to do, guys, we're just going to start plating. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my beans right here and plate these beans up right here. They smell really good. The bay leaf really push these beans right over the edge. Pinto beans right here. Put that right there. I'm going to take my greens and right here. Down south, we always put a little piece of meat and our in it. So we have this here. Greens here. Looks good. Smells good too. It smells off amazing. Amazing. Right here, I'm gonna take my chicken and do my chicken right here. I like two pieces of chicken. Now, what is a Southern meal that consists of collard greens and pinto beans without cornbread? Right here. So we're gonna put a couple of pieces of cornbread right here. And there you have it. Fried chicken, collard greens, pinto beans, and coleslaw. And you know what I say every week? Food is good. God is great. And every day is a blessing.